Hey, let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for this awesome morning. Thank you that we are gathered together freely. Thank you that every person in this room matters to you and matters to us. And Lord, what you put on my heart this morning as we pray is that you want every person in this room to know that there is no one that is too far out of your reach. No one. There is no one too far out of your grasp. There is no one that's too far away from you showing them your love. And I pray today, Lord, that this would just be a place of grace. This would not be a place of judgment, that, God, we would just be okay with who we are and where we are and, and whatever we bring into this place. I pray that we'd be okay, that you will meet us right there. So, God, I pray you open our hearts, help us to hear the message today. Help us just to be ready to respond. Let us not be people that just hear one thing and then maybe hear another thing and never do anything. But let us be a people that hear something and do something and change the world. God, I pray that prayer as well for Pastor Michael Latham, who's a part of New Horizon Baptist Church right here in Waynedale, who is preaching the gospel in two services, reaching this community. We pray that, God, you would just bless their church, bless their efforts, bless Michael and his leadership. And Lord, finally, I pray for the West Coast fires in Southern California. Lord, there's people losing their homes. There's people that are um, in desperate need of help and, and, and hope. And I just pray, Lord, that, that you would give strength to the, to the workers, to the firefighters, to everyone involved. And God, I pray that, that, that recovery and, and, and relief would come soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Look to the person right next to you and say, man, you, you look good this morning. Just say that. <laughs> All right. That feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> wow, you guys are really taking this seriously. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, you, you may not know this about me, but uh, I used to be a missions pastor for many years, and I was able to travel around the world and bring the, the message of Jesus to as many people as possible, and and just so enjoyed experiencing different cultures. One of my favorite cultures is in the country of Brazil. There's a man there named Pastor Moises, and we would go and work with Pastor Moises one time a year, and every year it was kind of this like, we check in and see how everybody's doing, and, and you kind of just, you know, you catch up on the, the last year's events, and I remember meeting Pastor Moises in the airport. He's this great, just gregarious, just over the top kind of passionate guy, and he comes up, and, and they called me K. Pablo in, in uh, Brazil. And, and he came up to me and goes, K. Pablo! Like this. And then he looks me up and down like this. You ever have that when someone looks you up and down? You're like, what are you looking at? Right? And he looks down, and he looks up, and then he comes up to me, and he grabs my midsection. He goes, oh! And then he grabs my belly, and he goes, K. Paul, you've gotten bigger! Just like that. I thought, Wow! I think I was sucking my tummy in the rest of the week uh, after that. But in Brazil, you see, it's a sign of, of joy and happiness when uh, you're, you're happy, you're content, you're eating well. And uh, I just met my wife at that time, so he put all that together, and, and he just was excited that I was bigger, for whatever that means. You know, Brazilians can get away with that. But in America, we wouldn't quite get away with that one, would we? In fact, in the United States, kind of in our culture, um, you know, it's not our tendency, it's not our, our, um, our norm, right, to just go up and kind of point out the obvious with other people. Uh, in fact, it's kind of rude in our culture to do that. In fact, as I think about this time of year, as I think about Christmas time, I, I just, I, I, I think of those times in my past where I always felt like, okay, it's Christmas time. I don't know if you guys are here with me or not, but it's that time of year where everybody gathers, you see your family, and everybody's kind of getting together, and you do like the, you know, hey, how's life? Like, what's going on? And, um, you know, you definitely don't say, hey, you, you definitely gained weight. You know, that's not what you do. But you do kind of do, you do updates, and, and, and you share things. And, and I have to just be very transparent as we start this morning. And say that I, I, uh, I'm 38 years old. I know what you're all thinking. Man, you, are, you look good for 38, right? I'm 38, but I didn't get married until I was 32 years old. Now, I met the woman of my dreams. 
in my early 30s, and she just so happens to be my wife, and I'm thankful for that. But for many, many years, I was single at Christmas time. And I felt every year like it was just this, like, this stirring up of these emotions of this, like, really, really extreme loneliness. I, I don't know if any of you guys can relate to, to what, I, what I felt for so many years, but the truth is there's maybe some of us in this room that are just lonely. Man, you're just, you know, at this time of year just stirs up all these, these things, right, and, and, and there's loneliness. And I can remember one Christmas in particular, I was so depressed and lonely, my family had to come and get me out of bed. And that's kind of hard to share, but that's truth. That's truth. And so this year, as exciting as it, as it is to remember that Jesus came and, and came for us and died for us, it's an amazing time of year. I would just like to suggest that we not just remember it this year. As we look at this series, The Greatest Gift, what does it mean to live the gift of Jesus this year in light of his name being Mighty God? That, that's his name. Like, can you imagine naming your baby Mighty God? Jesus came and his name was Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God and Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. That was his name. And today we're going to talk about what Mighty God means for us. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for us as we are dealing with normal things in life, hard things in life? What does it mean for us? If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. For the world, you are only as strong as you are able. For the world, you are only as strong as what, what your own strength, your own talent, your own smarts, your own ability can, can, can take you, the, as far as it can take you. For the world, you are only as strong as you are able. But for Christians, for Christians, now, the Christians is one of those words that is, is really kind of thrown around. But, but, but I like to think of Christians as Jesus followers, people that are obedient to the ways of Jesus. If, if you are obedient to the way of Jesus, if you are following Jesus with all of your life, you're a Christian. And, I, and, I, and I'm a Christian, and, and I'm proud to be a Christian. I'm proud to be a Jesus follower. And as we look to, to, to follow Jesus, right, so for the world, you're only as strong as you are able. But for Christians, for Jesus followers, hear this. Write this in, in your notes. We are only as strong as we are honest. For the world, we are only as strong as we are able. How much money we make, how much success we have. How many things that we do right in the eyes of the world, right? It's, it's our own abilities that, 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 that the world says is strength. But for Christians, as Jesus followers, there's this great oxymoron that we have to embrace as we look at what it means to live the gift of a mighty God, and that's this. We are only as strong as we are honest. We are only as strong as we are weak. The Apostle Paul teaches this. In a powerful way. In fact, if you don't know about the Apostle Paul, he was this man that hated Christians. He hated Jesus' followers. I mean, to the point where the Apostle Paul is outside the door as you leave church. He's taking notes. He's writing down your name. He's writing down your address. He's going to come to your house, and he's going he's to cause you problems. He's going to burn stuff. He's going he's to persecute you. He's going to make your life miserable. He might even take your life. He, he, he hated Christians before he became a Jesus follower. He hated them. But then Jesus encountered him, met him, met him in this, this very powerful place of truth. And Paul gave his life to Jesus and became one of the most effective leaders for the kingdom of Jesus the world will ever know. I mean, this guy preached to the thousands. This guy, because of Paul's work, he brought the gospel message out of, of Judea, Judaism, out of Israel, and into the Gentile world into the rest of the world, right? Paul is this amazing guy. He has all these opportunities to say, look at what I did. Look at what I've accomplished. And yet, he has one of the most honest moments in the, in the Bible. He wrote most of the New Testament. Today, we're going to talk about one of Paul's most honest moments of his life. And I want you to look at, at these words with, with me. In your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, because the Apostle Paul is going to teach us what it means to live the gift as a mighty God. Paul says in verse 7 of chapter 12, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly great revelations. Remember, we, we talked about all that he's done. He's got just incredible things happening. He says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, 
a messenger of Satan to torment me. Can you imagine sitting at the, the Christmas dinner table with someone and you're all going, hey, how was your year? Oh, my year was pretty good. Yeah, we you know, did good over here and did good over here. And then it gets around to your friend and he goes, man, like this was a tough year. I've got a messenger of Satan totally rocking my world right now. I mean, what honesty, what transparency. Paul, this guy who has all these accolades and all these titles and all this influence. I mean, think of this moment if you're at the table with this guy, right? He says, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, some wonder what that thorn in the flesh is. Some say it's he had uh, problems with his eyesight. Some say it was a uh, chronic illness uh, in his body. Um, we don't know what that thorn in the flesh was. But here's what I do know. I know that this thorn was so painful and so hurtful and such a sore spot in his life, he used the word torment in association with it. He called it a messenger of Satan. And then read on in verse 8. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Three times, Paul says, I pleaded for this to be taken away. Think of the transparency and the honesty, the, the, the truth coming out of this man's life. It was torment. He was struggling and he pleaded with Jesus to take it away from me. Let me tell you something this morning. I pleaded with Jesus to bring my wife to me years before he brought her to me. Pleaded and pleaded. I'm lonely. Jesus, please, please bring her to me. Please. By the way, I learned that he didn't bring her to me sooner because he had more preparing to do in me for her. But I see that as hindsight, which is 2020. But I can tell you for years and years and years, please bring her to me. I don't know if you can relate with that this morning. I don't know where you're at. I don't know, I don't know if that resonates with you at all. But I just know that, you know, those places, they, they are described as Paul, as places of torment, as places of just great struggle. And he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. In a room this size... I can only imagine that we've all pleaded with Jesus about something like, please take this away. Please take this away. Take this pain away. Take this, take this addiction away. Some of us, maybe we have, have, have an, an opioid addiction. And, and if that's you, I just want you to know, that's, it's, it's okay to be real with that, with the right people, because God can work through that. In fact, Celebrate Recovery is a ministry coming to our church. And we're going to be a church that, that addresses those dire needs, those areas of, of addiction. Some of us are in this room and we're, we're feeling shame. We're feeling shame of letting our family down, shame of letting our kids down, shame of letting our boss down. We're feeling shame. We just feel like we've let everybody down. We just feel shame, shame, shame. We, we, we just, we're, we're just swimming in, in shame. And it's tormenting us. Maybe some of us, it's fear, fear of next. Fear of what job I need to get over here. Fear of the fact that I need to move over here. Fear of the fact that my job is uncertain. Fear of the fact that, that I'm, 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 I'm really concerned about people that I love that are making certain decisions and fear of what it's going to mean in their life. There's fear. Maybe some of us feel that fear, and we could describe it and understand it with Paul as this place of torment. Maybe there's this fear, and you're pleading with Jesus to take it away from me. Take it away from me. Wherever that area in your life where it's the weakest and you don't want to talk about it, you want to push it under the rug, that's a, probably a place where you're saying, Jesus, just take it away. Take it away. Take it away. Maybe for some of us it's unhappiness and frustration in our marriage. You just want, just, Jesus, just take away the frustration. Take away the unhappiness. Take it away. Take it away. Take it away. And you feel that torment. You feel that, that pleading that we see here in the Apostle Paul's writing. Maybe it's dissatisfaction in, in your job. Maybe you've just been in the same old humdrum process of working and you feel like you're just a widget maker and you feel like you're just, you don't have purpose in your job and you're crunching numbers and, and you just, just Jesus, <laughs> take, it, take it away. Just, I want something else. Take it away. I'm just pleading. Maybe that's the thorn in your flesh. I don't know. But I know we all have these areas of weakness and other areas of reality in our life. But hang on, don't lose hope. If I've depressed you, hang on. Because look at these next verses. 
2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul says, Jesus said to me, listen to this. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, if you're listening online, you can do this with us too. But I want everybody in this room, I want you to read that last part with me. I'll read the first part. Read the last part with me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, here it is. For my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in those areas where there is pleading, in those areas where you just want him to take it away. God's power will be made perfect in those areas. Did you hear that? Perfect. Perfection will happen in those areas of torment, in those areas where we're pleading, where we're single and lonely, addicted, shame, fearful, unhappiness. Paul says, Jesus told me, here it is, I love this, Jesus told me, my grace is sufficient. So I've worked hard on this expression so you can remember it. So if you could, write this down. Grab a pen, grab a pencil, write this down. I want every person in this room to hear this, including myself. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're dealing with, wherever that pleading is, wherever that torment is, wherever that thorn in the flesh is, we can all identify that. Hear this. Jesus offers his grace, and I want you to underline this word, sufficient. It's sufficient for you. It's sufficient for me. And here's the phrase. God meets us in our place of weakness. God meets us in our place of weakness. The world would say strength is defined by what you're able to do, by by how much you're able to earn, by how much you're able to influence other people. Ability, ability, ability. But for Christians, God (laughs) meets us with power in our place of weakness. God meets us in our weakness. Say it with me. God meets us in our place of weakness. Psalm 34, 18 shares, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Isn't that incredible? You know, think about it this way. If we're all walking around acting like we've got it all figured out and, we do, and we're doing good, like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. If that's our heart, that's our attitude, guess what? You're, 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 the message you're sending in your life is you don't need God. And I think as Christians, sometimes we, maybe we send that message a little too quickly. No, I'm good. I'm good. No, I, I really don't need your help. No, I, I really don't want to get honest about what's really going on. I'm good. And therefore, we suggest that we don't need God. We are only as strong as we are honest. We are only as strong as we are weak. So I have a challenge for you. <laughs> Choose the grace space. <laughs> Choose the place where you can get honest with people. Now, people that you can trust and that you can walk with, but choose the grace space. Choose to live in a place where grace is in the middle of your relationship in your marriage. Grace is in the middle of your relationship with your children, where you can be honest and you can share what's really going on. Choose the grace space with your coworkers. Build an environment of trust where you can say what's really going on, where everybody knows that everyone's not saying what's really going on. Choose the grace space. Why? Because Jesus said, grace is sufficient. Hear that? Avalon Church is a grace-based church for a reason, because we believe that if we meet in a place of grace, we will be able to meet people where they are and not meet people in a place where we, where we think they should be. <laughs> if that makes sense. Many churches, I believe, they, 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 they don't create a safe place to just be who you are, because it, it, on the outside, it looks like you've got to be perfect to come in. And we're not a perfect church. We're a place that's grace-based, that puts grace in the middle of every relationship so that God can work in us and through us. Pastor Rick Hawks is a pastor here in Fort Wayne of a church called The Chapel. And he, he's a mentor of mine. Uh, has been since I, I've been about 15 years old. He's, he's invested in my life in a big way. And I'll never forget something he said to me. He, he, he's been a pastor for 35, 40 years. And he said there was a time that was so rough in his pastorate. It was so rough. Everything was being questioned. Um, There there was problems coming at him everywhere, problems coming at at him everywhere. In fact, you may not know this, but but, but people like to pick on pastors sometimes, right? 
And, and it was just like nothing was going right. And, and he looked at me one day and, and he said, in those moments, what came to me was, I just hope that people offer me the same amount of grace that I hope to offer them. Can you imagine? If we just put grace in the middle, and if we just offered others as much grace as we hoped that we received from them, I mean, our driving, our, our like, road rage would, like, get eliminated right away. Like, if we just offered people grace that cut us off, if we just offered people grace that we're having a bad day, if we just offered people, maybe our, our spouses, just grace that they got no sleep last night, that, that's, that's happened in our home a little bit. <laughs> what, what if we just offered grace and hope that people offered grace back? I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I think that would, that, would, that would show a mighty God. I think that would show a very special place. And I think Paul speaks to this. Jesus said to Paul, he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In many places in the world, um, I, I've been able to travel. I've been blessed to see uh, most, most of the continents in the world. In fact, most countries in the world are called majority world countries. And that's because um, we are not the majority here in America. If you don't know that, I'm sorry to ruin your day. <laughs> we are the minority. No one has the infrastructure we have. No one has the resources we have. No one throws away as much as we do, okay? Most of the country lives off of our trash, or most, most countries in the majority world live off of the trash of countries like America. This is true. So we have so much. We have so much to be grateful for. We are so resourced. Most countries don't have the infrastructure of the roads. They don't have the infrastructure of, of power grids, of power lines. I mean, this is amazing. I wish I could, I could show you a picture, but in, in we'll just say Brazil, um, every power line, if you think of a power line, at the place where the power lines meet, it looks like a rat's nest, just all these wires, literally just a big rat's nest. And if you look at it, you're worried that the local squirrels are going to get electrocuted. You're really worried about the local squirrels, right? But, but here's the deal. People are tapping into the power grid system because there is an infrastructure to go to their house. They're tapping into the wires because they need to bring at least enough power into their homes to have a television set and have a light bulb, right? The two most important things. And, and, and these, these, these nests of wires, they just kind of go, and literally the wires go over houses. They, they cover rooftops in most cities. And when you're driving at nighttime, what you'll see in these majority world countries is people huddled around the little light bulb. And they'll be doing, you know, dominoes is a, is a favorite game in, in some countries. But they'll be playing their games. They'll be watching TV. But the room, for the most part, is dark. But there's this little light bulb, right? Like there's this little light bulb. And, you know, God, God showed me something this week I want to share with you this morning. God, God showed me that this is what it looks like when the church, when the Jesus followers of the church, when they try to do this in their own abilities, when they try to do it on their own strengths, when they try to really not, not tell people what's really going on, but they're just, I'm going to get this, do this myself. I'm going to pull up my bootstraps. I'm going to do this. I'm strong enough to get through this. Here's what it looks like. It looks like a bunch of people that are huddled around a little light bulb. And we've just figured out how to get enough light to get by. we figured out how to get enough light to light up the room just enough, just enough to get by. we figured out how to get the power on our own ability to get that power that we need. But I want to tell you something this morning. If we are ready to be honest about our weakness, if we are, if we are strong, we are to be honest. And if we are honest, write this in your notes. God's light will shine through us. God's light will shine through us. We are only as strong as we are honest. And we are honest, and when we are honest, God's power shines through us. Now listen to this, Christians, and, and those that aren't Jesus followers yet. Listen, listen, this is awesome about Jesus. When Jesus came, he brought a light that wouldn't require us to huddle around a little man-made light anymore. He, when Jesus came, we don't have to, to rely on our own strengths anymore. When Jesus came, we don't have to rely on our own abilities anymore. I mean, this is just, this is the good news of the gospel of Jesus. We don't have to steal power from the world anymore, Christians. We don't have to look like the world, Christians. We don't, we don't have to look like the people out there that are doing it all on their own strengths. We don't have to look like everybody else, amen? amen. We, we, we have a power source 
And, and his name is Jesus. Say that. Jesus. And his name is Mighty God. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. His name is Jesus. And he is our power source. This is incredible. He is our power source. So we don't have to steal power from the world. We get lit up with the power of Jesus, right? So what happens when we get honest? What happens when we choose the grace space? What happens? Guess what? People see light. People see light. Because we're only as strong as we are honest. And when we are honest, God's light shines through us. And here's what I mean. When we are honest, people can connect to us. I've heard it said, People are impressed with our strengths, but they're connected to our weaknesses. And I think sometimes we're just, we're all over the place trying to impress people with our strengths. But the reality is people will connect to us in our weakness. And when people connect to us in our weaknesses, in our struggles, in our realities, in the truth of what's going on, we will become more real to them. And I think our lives will be more real to the world. Because people connect to real people. So if we're doing a series called Live the Gift, how do we live the gift? How do we live the gift who's called Mighty God? How do we do that? Here's how. We get real. We get honest. Because we can't be the gift if we aren't connected to people. If we never go to that place of weakness in our life, God can't do a mighty work in us, and therefore we can't lead others to a place of power and a place of light. Now hear this. Please hear this. Pastor Sidney's going to come up. We're going to sing a song that's going to unpack this a little more. But here's what I want you to hear. If, if you, if we, if I, if we aren't bringing these areas of torment, these areas of weakness to God, right? If we're not bringing them to him and trusting him with these areas in our life, God therefore will not be able to take us where he needs to take us in the healing in the restoration, in the reconciliation, in the growth. If we always try to do it on our own ability, God cannot meet us in that place of weakness, in that place of honesty. And if we're not there with God, how are we going to lead others there with God? If we're to live the gift, we're to be honest, and that's our strength. And when we're honest, God's power shines through us. There's a song called Give Me Faith that Sydney's going to sing, and I, and I want you guys to see these words, and then we're going to sing it together. The chorus goes like this. It's called Give Me Faith. Chorus, give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great, and I'm broken inside. I give you my life. Because I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail. My God you never will. Give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, but I give you my life. Because I may be weak, but your spirit's strong in me. My flesh may fail. My God, you never will. Listen to these words. to trust me.
Go ahead and grab a seat as you do. Hear this truth about Jesus this morning as we think of what it means to live the gift, as we think of the greatest gift is Jesus, and he is called Mighty God. Think of this this morning. Two of the most important times in Jesus' life were identified with total weakness, right? Jesus came as a baby into this world. We celebrate that every year. Total weakness, total helplessness. It was the greatest gift the world has ever seen. When Jesus went to the cross, he did so with all the power, but he also did so for our sins. In total weakness, he gave his body, he gave his flesh. It wasn't the nails that, had him to the, that held him to the cross, it was his love. The world would identify the cross as total weakness. But Jesus said to his disciples, pick up your crosses, carry them, and follow after me. What a picture of weakness. What a picture of God's strength. We're only as strong as we are honest, and when we are honest, God's power shines through us. So what's Paul's takeaway? Paul is going to give us one more verse here. And I wonder, what, what's his takeaway? What's his, his, his kind of final thought in this God's power is made perfect in weakness? Here it is. Verse 9. Paul says this. Therefore, all, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly, hear this, about my weaknesses. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. For the world, you are only as strong as you are able. But for Christians, we are only as strong as we are weak, as we are honest. So our greatest, hear this, please hear this, dear friends. Our greatest area of weakness in life, hear this, is also the greatest area of God's strength to show up. Amen? Our greatest area of torment, our greatest area of suffering, our greatest area of pain, our greatest area of addiction, our greatest area of sorrow, of fear, of shame. That is where God wants to show up with his mighty strength. That's where God wants to show up. 
So how do we live the gift of Almighty God? Paul says it this way. For Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, my insults, my hardships, <laughs> my persecutions. I delight in my difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Hear this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So how do we live the gift of a mighty God? One more time, we do so by putting grace right in the middle of every relationship and start making la this life, this, this life we have, start making it less about what we can do and more about how we can't do without God's power in our lives. Hear this, Jesus was stretched out on the cross in total weakness. He took the sins of the world to the grave and his willingness to die for the sins of the world showed that he would go all the way to the death of darkness in order that God would raise him from the dead and have his son, Jesus Christ, break out of the grave with light. Yeah. Be honest. Be honest. Be weak. Be the light. Live a life that isn't about your abilities. Live a life that is about a mighty God. Let's pray. Jesus, help me, help us, help all of us to be honest and real about our weaknesses. Help us to choose grace and to live a life that is not defined by our own abilities, but by your power. Use us, dear God, use me, use all of us this week to live the gift of your son that we might put on display that you are an almighty God. In the name of our greatest gift, Jesus, amen. Stand with me. Let's worship in response to Jesus this morning. Let's worship with all of our hearts. Let's just sing out with everything we have.